Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here on History is here to help on a given Thursday. We're gonna talk about Eastern Europe post 1945 and see how it is here to help, okay? And my uh, co-host and contributor, Peter Hoffenberg, uh, and our guest today, Carl Ackerman. Um, Carl is a uh, history and, and social studies professor at Punahou for the past 209 years. Welcome to the show, Carl. I think it's 2009 years, actually. Oh, got it. <laughs> uh, the, student, the students would differ, I think. <laughs> we'll have to ask the students. It's been the Pleistocene with Carl. Yeah. Well, Peter, um, why, why don't you give a, a more sensible uh, introduction Not Carl, sensible, but pleasurable and, to welcome back. And, and talk about the scope of our show today. Right. I hope some of our viewers recognize that handsome face. Uh, last time we asked him to talk about his award-winning Quayle program. Uh, today, we're bringing him back uh, with a different yarmulke, and that's as a PhD in Russian history from a relatively small, insignificant university in Northern California called University of California, Berkeley. So Stanford fans can <clears throat> do what they want with that, uh, and he, where he studied with a, a very prominent scholar. So uh, Jay and I have asked um, Carl back, uh, not as a teacher really so much, even though he has a fine expertise in that, but really as a scholar and to ask about something that we only really get little vapors here and there about what the heck is going on in what we used to call Europe east of the Elbe or Eastern or Central Europe. And in particular, I'd like to ask Carl questions, uh, Dr. Ackerman really in this case, questions about Russia. Uh, the emphasis will be on post-1945, but I think we can find a lot of continuities and a lot of ideas since at uh, the end of the Second World War. So let me turn it back to Jay, who always has the excellent questions. Uh, and Carl, get ready. Get ready. Carl, I, I have, have your a, Oxford a, University Press book and have it handy. I have a completely unfair uh, question for you, but you know, the, the, the unfair questions have a place on our Think Tech talk shows. Um, so here, 1945, the end of World War II, uh, Eastern Europe, which was a real mess at that time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, having come out of the war, it was all, you know, a train wreck. Um, so from that point on forward till now, what are the salient events from which and trends uh, from which we can learn to appreciate it today? <laughs> You know, um, Jay, I would start with um, uh, 1945 um, and say, you know, what people should do is they should look and find in Central Europe the Elbe River, because that's where the Russians and the um, uh, Americans, etc., and the Allies uh, met one another. So if you go to the east of the Elbe um, for the period between 1945 and 1989, um, you're going to have Soviet dominance, which means, you know, a Marxist-Leninist um, uh, a format, um, uh, with the exception a bit of Yugoslavia, and um, with exceptions of uh, Switzerland, um, you're going to have essentially, you know, um, um, Eastern European countries that's from Poland and Hungary, Bulgaria, etc., uh, dominated by the former Soviet Union and Marxist-Leninist framework. Um, because you asked for a couple of salient points, of course, the key date then is 1989, um, when the Berlin Wall falls, or the collapse of the Soviet Union on August 14th, 1991, where I happened to be at the very time with about 20 students. So wow. I, got, I got a firsthand look at that in Moscow. The cause but, of the decline. Yeah, did, yeah. They, did they get special yeah. credit for that course? Yeah, the precipitating <laughs> they, cause. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, uh, yeah I as happen a Marxist, to be, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be that small, uh, I happened to be in that small university that uh, Peter said shortly thereafter. And when I was interviewed by a news channel, uh, I don't know how they got my number, <laughs> um, but they did. Uh, they uh, what I what they said was that kids got a, you know one of the best history lessons, and of course they were all scared out of their minds as as, as I was because there were tanks always around us. And I, I see the CIA. The CIA provided you with yeah twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> Maybe stipend. They, thank you, Carl. They, they land, you know we landed in Moscow on August nineteenth, nineteen ninety one, from Sochi, and of course there had been. Um, you know, uh, classical music on the on the phone. My kids were all spread out in different. They were high school kids, um, all in different homes and in Sochi. And we gathered together. We were supposed to leave and go, and of course they let us go. And uh, my uh, friend from um, uh, the 
uh, Soviet app part of our, our tour, you know, said Carl Leopoldovich, my patronymic, patronymic name, small um, problem, uh, a coup d'etat. <laughs> and I said, well, thanks, Sergei. His name was Sergei. <laughs> Which that's a Russian tradition, a coup. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you can just oh, uh, make, make your oh, teeth. Uh, some so, people say we have them here in the US too, but that's not part of the show. And Jay, just to just to complete the um complete sure? the complete the uh, the the salient um uh, points um i would say from 1991 to the per current day you know you still have those you know in many eastern european countries you don't have the traditions of democracy nor do you have the traditions of of you know the protestant reformation or the but you have either the catholic church or the russian orthodox church but you 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 have different developments in east in eastern europe much like you have in western europe today uh with the with the battle, the the sway between authoritarianism and um, and also democratic democratic traditions, um, and uh, um, I'm going to stop there. I am reminded of Anne Applebaum's article in the Atlantic uh, about a year ago, where she spoke about what motivated people to hang on to those authoritarian traditions for all those years in Eastern Europe. She had several you know, different things that made them hang on. But the, the one that sticks in my head was fear. Eastern Europe was a study in fear for those days, wasn't it? Uh, I would say, you know, that, you know, you, you have to remember that, you, you know, you do have some Eastern European countries, you know, that are, that had experiments with democracy, but for the country that controlled them um, uh, after 1945, um, and that is, you know, the former Soviet Union, that the former Soviet Union only had a brief experiment with democracy, you know, with the Duma and the fall of the Tsar. Um, and uh, of course, the Duma came about in 1905 and um, only lasted till 1917. And, you know, unfortunately, you had a bunch of, uh, you know, very um, great experiments. And, you know, in, in, you know, once uh, uh, Russia had pulled out of the war briefly, you had a lot of liberal ideas and um, but they didn't last very long. And so um, you had this tradition of uh, totalitarianism and it spread, of course, with the with the Soviet um, with Soviet troops, you know, in Eastern Europe. And of course, I always point out that, you know, we always um, focus on, you know, D-Day, but, you know, it was really the Soviets that, you know, um, did the did the great harm to the to the German armies, you know, um, in Stalingrad and then um, retreating back. Not that the not that Joseph Stalin was any good because, you know, he would force people into battle by shooting them if they retreated. So you know. very, effective, very effective, though. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. If, you want to win, if you want to win a war, that's an effective way to do it. What a way to go. So, um, you know, what, what I get out of all of this is that is that we can learn well, we should be able to learn something from the evolution of uh, authoritarian government through uh, the USSR or otherwise at, at the end of the war till more recently where it hasn't been so authoritarian. Because right now we have arguably the return of authoritarianism in various countries in Europe. Uh, but we also have, um, you know, glimmers of, of the dem democratic governments in Europe. So the, the question is, how did they get away from authoritarianism? How did they, you know, move to evolve to a more democratic style? And what can we learn from that? Well, you know, I think that just like any society, um, you know, one of the countries that I think would be the most interesting to look at is Poland, because, you know, Poland began with its own um, solidarity movement. And the, the whole that the the Marxist Leninist um, totalitarian regime it doesn't you don't have to be I mean, you could possibly be a Marxist and also be a Democrat too, small d. Um, but with the, with the current with the situation in uh, in Poland, um, you know, you had the Catholic Church being strong in people's lives, you know, even under the totalitarian rules. So people had, you know, an incentive to buck the system um, all the way along. And um, the, uh, the other part of this is that, you know, what's interesting and what most commentaries, uh, news commentaries don't comment on is that there's a huge number of uh, Eastern European countries that are members of NATO. Um, and a huge number of Eastern European countries that are part of the uh, general European community. And so 
it's very difficult uh, to join both organizations and remain, um, you know, too conservative because you have the Western democracies of England and France, and of course the key democracy. Um, and of course, when you talk about Eastern Europe, you know, of course, East Germany was absorbed by Western Ger Germany, and, and they're all part of the um, uh, general German state. And ironically, at the time, I was kind of against the, uh, uniting both Germanys. I wanted to make them into two separate countries because I was so afraid of what happened in the middle of the 20th century. But when they reunited, and I was wrong, um, when they reunited, uh, they produced, you know, a very... Uh, uh, democratic, uh, um, uh, 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 very democratic tendencies, even though there's, a, there's you know, right wing elements in France and right wing elements in England, that, which are Western European countries. Um, but, you know, the fact that you have uh, someone like Angela Merkel emerging from East Germany and becoming chancellor and pro, pro, perhaps the most progressive and most democratic of all European leaders is, is a real sign of what happened um, in Eastern Europe who were craving this, you know, democratic uh, uh, front. So I think it's, you know, a multifaceted thing. And even the Ukraine, you know, uh, uh, the European Union has this kind of like emerging European, Euro, uh, European uh, countries. And even the Ukraine, um, you know, once they get a, a, a leader that can divorce themselves from, um, completely divorce themselves from any kind of Russian hegemony, um, wants to join the European Union. So there we go. And if you look at a map of the European Union and, and you look at a map of NATO, that's all over Eastern Europe. So that's a good sign. Uh, yeah, I want to cover some other countries. Uh, and you can tell me these countries should no longer be on the map. Um, or you can tell me they're doing well. Okay, we talked already about Poland, we talked about Ukraine, Belarus, we've seen that in the, in the newspaper. What about Belarus? Where do they stand on the, the barometer of democracy? Belarus is, is, is not very democratic, and um, they are uniting with, you know, the greater Russian um, sovereignty. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of, you know, uh, extended union there. I mean, not that Vladimir Putin doesn't control a lot of things there anyway, but I would be uh, you know, Belarus is one of those countries, if you look at the map, um, is not aligned with uh, with NATO and not aligned with the European uh, Union. Hmm. Uh, what about Romania? Romania is. I mean, I think Romania is both, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not, I can't be positive about this, but what, from what I remember, Romania is both a part of the European Union and NATO. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure about the European Union. I think it, it's part of NATO also. Um, and so, um, you know, almost every European country, except there are some um, countries in the former Yugoslavia that I think are not part of NATO um, and, and are not part of the European Union, but most countries, including Bulgaria, um, Romania, um, uh, Poland, um, of course, the Czech Republic. And the Czech Republic, of course, was a, was a great example um, of uh, democracy being run by Sir Havel, um, you know, who had been writing democratic treatises, you know, um, as part of the his anti-Soviet uh, period, and of course a playwright to boot. So, you know, you got to love Czech, the Czech Republic because you know you you had a former leader, um, you know, who was not only a Democrat but also you know playwright. When you think about it, a lot of these countries have made, uh, or people from these countries have made significant contributions to Western society, Western culture, Western art, Western science. Uh, the next one on my list is, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, Hungary. Now, Hungary is an interesting part because I believe Hungary is both part of the European Union and NATO, um, but it has a strong man um, now as its leader. And interestingly enough, if I'm not wrong about this, and I don't want to, Peter, you can correct me, um, but I, I believe he is the example that uh, Tucker Carlson has gone. He is. Uh, from Tucker Hungary. Carlson went last month and had a week of shows yeah. uh, um, focused on uh, the American relationship with uh, an individual they, that America should be promoting. And, and, and I'm more than happy to discuss that if that length you mm, want to discuss that. Yeah, I, I think Carl, I think Carl is just, absolutely right that, that Tucker Carlson uh, took. Uh, is, let me, uh, Peter, let me finish uh, my, my okay. list. Uh, right. and then we, you, okay, then we, you mentioned the Czech Republic. Uh, I saw Slovakia on, on the map. Slovakia still exists, I guess. What yeah. is it like there? And by the way, it sounds like 
that if a country is in the EU, it is by definition at least somewhat democratic. Is that is that correct? Is that one of the standards for admission to the EU? Um, you know, I'll, I'll let Peter. Uh, no, I, I don't. I think um, uh, we want to have a slightly complementary and connected relationship with Carl's superb political and institutional analysis. We got to remind ourselves, and this can answers your question, Jay. Uh, that economic relations are crucial. And the EU uh, invites people, saves them like Greece, uh, very often based upon economic trade, capital investment, et cetera. So you could be authoritarian and be a very good economic market. And you could be in the EU. Uh, the difficulty is the flip side. You could be a democracy like Greece and have a horrible economy and still be in the EU. So the answer is that uh, democracy is not the litmus test. Yeah, uh, well, to, to win least, Hungary, yeah. Hungary right. is an and, example well, of that. Yeah. What it is, is uh, again, complement to Carl's important political discussion, is remember democracy, and here's where Marxist Democrats come in, uh, to remind ourselves it's not just the institutions, it's the nature of society, right? You can have democratic institutions or seemingly democratic institutions, but a non-democratic society. And that's really what we're talking about in almost all these places. They are all driven by ethnic nationalism, ethnic dominance, ethnic dominance, which means anti-Semitism, which means uh, hatred of non-Western uh, migrants. And, and whereas that gets a lot of press when it happens in France, it happens on a regular basis in these countries in Eastern Europe. So the response to, to Carl's important comments would be, all right, Jay, yeah, <laughs> they might have institutions, they may be voting, they may be parties, but who gets to vote? <laughs> what influence does a minority party have? What is their attitude to foreigners? And on the, in that regard, most of these countries uh, score well below what you want your movie to score on Rotten Tomatoes, well below. And Hungary is a prime example of that. It has institutions. But it is highly ethnocentric. Uh, I would even go and say it's highly racist. It's not a democratic society. So that's the I, question. On the question, I, I of rotten, on the question of Rotten Tomatoes, my wife and I saw a movie last night, which was the first time we ever saw a movie like this, which was Bulgarian. Okay, a Bulgarian movie. That's one of the reasons we like Netflix so much is it has this, this enormous diversity of movies and enormous diversity of languages. Well, of course, there were English subtitles. We could understand it. And it was um, it was about a, the misuse of an intelligence apparatus by some fellow who ran it. Okay, and, and that showed you there was a kind of governmental corruption in Bulgaria. I'm proud of it. Um, the other thing it showed you was that, that there was a certain value on human life in the, in the, in the takeaway from this movie. Um, and it, there were moral values in play, uh, which I thought was interesting. So it was like a Western movie. I think it was built for a Western audience. The production values were good. The economics undoubtedly were good. They got it on Netflix. Um, the bottom line is that uh, uh, Bulgaria has entered the you know, the the economic world of uh, making a movie like this and uh, and it has catered to western values in making a movie absolutely. like this absolutely and when you look at the and when you see a movie like that you want to try to stay awake the whole time and you want to see at the end whether or not the european film community has also invested in it so when you see a european movie these days there's often british and french money which answers in part your your question about you know, maybe it's a wider audience. I think we also have to be uh, very careful. And if our listeners, you know, want to use films, um, let's take a look at what was censored. All, all these countries have either self-imposed censorship or governmental censorship, right? That's why we have the standards in the United States, because the creator of the standards did not want the government to do what he thought the government would do. But in most countries, the government does that. So when I see a Bulgarian movie, you know, I, I agree with you entirely. It's a work of art. It appeals to probably a non-Bulgarian audience, but I am really interested in what's on the cutting room floor. And please remember, when we talk about these societies and your, your listeners 
our listeners are probably mostly in Hawaii, which is a relatively liberal society. Please remember that most of these governments do not support gay, lesbian, and trans rights. That ends up on the cutting room floor. Uh, most of them are not multiracial. That ends up on the cutting room floor. And like Russia's Putin, they tend to be very puritanical about sex. That ends up on the... So I, I think like, if I were to teach this, I mean, I would ask the students to think about what didn't get screened and ask that question as well. Oh, I'm and, sure. In, in this yeah. case, it was a question of the the actions of an intelligence agency, a government intelligence agency. And, and you knew the Bulgarian government had something to say about how that issue was handled in the movie. You know that. <laughs> right. So it would be interesting to see, you know, what was OK and what was not OK for the government censor, just like yeah. with our movies today. But, yeah. but we have a private company that does it, not, not the government. Well, yeah. Carl, let me let me turn to you and ask you, um, you know, you mentioned, or was it Peter? One of you mentioned We're the same. <laughs> that yeah, you are the same. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, you know the migrants have had a big play in Eastern I, Europe, I mentioned that. yeah, as, as they have in Western Europe, certainly. Sure. Um, and you know that sort of turns things to to, to the right. Uh, it makes people, mm, you know, become what's the word uh, nationalistic, um, and it maybe takes them back a step or two rather than forward. Uh, and you know, even Ang Angela Merkel is leaving office. Like yesterday, she stepped down. So um, you know, we're going to have a different tone in Germany, I think. But in Eastern Europe, we we're moving already to a different tone, and. It will become, uh, I, I'm suggesting this possibility, more authoritarian, and it may not be a direct result of the migrant, um, you know, phenomenon, um, but it may be an indirect of the migrant result of the micro of the uh, migrant phenomenon. What, what do you think about that, Carl? Are we moving to the right, and what effect has the migrant phenomenon had on all that? Uh, well, you know. As Peter noted, um, you know, the migrant phenomenon, as, as you noted, Jay, just now, um, has produced, you know, sort of a, the same sort of um, reactionary feelings that, you know, we, we were getting in the United States about what's going on, you know, south of the border in Texas, right, now, at this very moment. Um, it doesn't have to be just Latinos, it can be Haitians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I want to go back to answer your question to what Peter said about ethnic divisions. You know, um, it's... You know, in, in, in the United States, um, people are, are rightly concerned about racial divisions. Um, but when you see another Caucasian person, not always, unless you're far right, um, if someone is Jewish, if someone's Italian, if someone is Irish, people don't readily recognize the differences um, if you are Caucasian most of the time. That's what I would say. Until you go but into it, the kitchen. Yeah. You got to go into the kitchen and then you're yeah. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah, it, yeah that's true. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but, if it, but in Eastern Europe, they're very aware of this. And I want to tell you both a story from my teaching experience at Special School 238 in, in, um, at that time, Leningrad. And I was asking the kids, I always found, you know, the, the real litmus test for me about children um, who were high school age is to ask them who they would marry. You know, would they marry anyone of any ethnic background? And um, the uh, Russian women and men, because uh, um, it was mostly uh, Russians um, in this class, a great Russian nationality um, or Ukrainian nationality. And they all said they would prefer to marry another Russian or Ukrainian uh, person. Um, some of the women, interestingly enough, said uh, we would like to marry a Jewish person because Jewish men don't beat their wives, which I thought was a very interesting. Uh, Talk about you know, myth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very Actually, interesting it's comment. Reverse. It's very reverse. interesting we comment. Get we get beat that yeah. seemed to be the stereotype because, you know, uh, and it has to do a lot with the alcoholism in mm. all of Eastern Europe, but specifically in Russia. Right. But when I asked them about whether they would marry, and I wasn't talking about, you know, um, migrants coming from Northern Africa or migrants coming from anywhere else who had a different color, um, but, uh, but even, you know, people from, you know, uh, who might be what we consider Hapa or uh, Asian, they said, oh, no, we'd never marry them. You know, if, if they came, they were Korean and they came from Kazakhstan um, because uh, we, they're so different. They're cultural, you know, they're so, so different culturally. And these kids, you know, I mean, they're, 
they're not saying it with the recognition that that might imply some sort of, you know, ethnic discrimination or racial discrimination. They're, they were being honest and, and, and forthright. And I was their teacher. So um, it was interesting. And if you compare that to, um, you know, uh, classes that I had at Iolani and Punahou, um, the students will generally respond that they'll marry anyone of, of any um, uh, nationality. And interestingly enough, in terms of the gender issue, um, which was also very different in Eastern Europe. They're much more tradition, uh, traditional right. in most countries. Yeah. As, 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 as Peter said, I remember there, were, uh, you, you, there have been various friends of mine that have um, emigrated here, and they still re retain those sort of traditional uh, values of women and men. Um, you know, they will... Uh, they 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 continue in those sort of um, uh, relationships. But if you were to ask again, someone from a kid from McKinley High School or from Puna or from Milani, mm -hmm. they'll say, you know, we'll do equal share of, of the work and things like that. Interestingly enough, uh, and I, I hope this doesn't uh, fit in too badly for one of the private mm -hmm. schools that I've taught in my life. When I asked um, uh, in the class about who would do the uh, who would do the you know dishes and who would do the the kind of work that you know Peter and I grew up with, um, and uh, Jai Jay, I'm sure you did too. You know, doing chores, and doing dishes, and doing things around the house. Um, they said to me, <laughs> which had me laughing. They said, uh, Doctor Ackerman, you know, we're going to make so much money that um, that we'll have we'll have hired help. And I thought, you know, neither of us will do this. And I thought, well, nice. okay, that be nice. Okay, I want to be one of you. I, I have the question. Too. I got the answer. Right. You know, I just right. I, I came home until I, think, I, I think Carl, <laughs> Carl touches on a very important point in two ways for us and our audience. One is that this right now is the state with the large the highest percentage of intermarriage across the country. The highest percentage, um, which is, I think, a very positive step. Okay, so that's to echo even in the public schools, we quite often have what Carl said. And secondly, it's a reminder that um, while we could, well, we were very concerned about white supremacy, quote unquote, we're very concerned about the French Republic's problems, uh, ethnic nationalism is just baked into Eastern Europe. And it's actually baked into most of the world. Uh, if you look at what's going on in India, in Turkey, in places like Brazil. I mean, one way is to see that, even in China, right, where the Han ethnic group is the dominant ethnic group, right? We, we in America, and I think that people as old as us can recall that. There were New York firms which would not hire a Catholic, New York firms which would not hire a Protestant. But uh, because of our focus, as Carl says, on race, we tend to too easily map race onto other societies where ethnicity is really the distinction. Now, the difficulty, is, as Carl implies, is that in other societies, ethnicity does what racism does here. In other words, the implication is you're born that way. Everything that you have, everybody in your group shares. And as Carl suggests, if one were to marry, right, there would be a dilution of the ethnicity. So in many ways, it, that, that can map. And that worries me a lot to answer your macro question, okay, is particularly the migrant issue, which is the challenge for all societies, right? Are you going to be an open, inclusive, egalitarian, multicultural society, however you define culture? Uh, the verdict so far in Eastern Europe is no. But is it moving? But I would also add, let me just add one there? sentence. Let me just add one sentence. That it's a mistake for us to say that the migrant issue has created a new problem. Because the migrant issue is, is just con the contemporary reflection of a long history of ethnic nationalism in which the migrants could easily be replaced in the 19th century by the Romai, by the Jews, by others who lived. They weren't necessarily migrants, right? They've been Jews in Poland. Uh, since, well, at least before last week. So I'm, I want people to understand and think about, these are not necessarily new problems. When Hungarians attack migrants and Jews, they're tapping into Hungarian political culture for centuries and centuries. Let's be honest, in the US, right? This is not, racism is not new. The reflection might be new, but it's tapping into something. So I, I think in order to say, you know, how can these countries become democratic? They have to do what we have to do, which is come to terms with their past 
as a well, donor. In Eastern, in Eastern Europe, Carl, right. would you say that this uh, baked in condition in these countries has slowed down their progress? I mean, people generally think of Eastern Europe as behind the game. Mm -hmm. uh, is this one of the reasons or is it one of the um, you know, effects? Uh, and is it going to continue to do that? Is it going to continue to make them vulnerable to dictatorships? I think the answer to your last question is a definite yes. Um, but I, I also think that there are mitigating factors because if you, you know, if you, I think, um, you know, I just saw a Pew poll in the last couple of weeks about um, not only Eastern Europe, but, you know, Russia also, I mean, the, all of Russia, um, about how people are adapting to the new, um, you know, sem semi-democratic uh, capitalist framework. And um, most people approve, you know, and I, you have to remember that since 1991, you know, we have more than 30 years of, or at least 30 years of, you um, of uh, history so that, you know, people are adapting to these new circumstances. So I think uh, because of the, again, the economic connection, et cetera, that there, there's, there's definitely hope. Um, but these, these uh, traditions run strong. And, um, you know, you know, um, you know, as, as Peter alluded to, even in the United States, that, you know, it was only a generation ago, and it, probably with our parents, all our collective parents, that people were very conscious of ethnic um, divisions, too, and whether they would marry a person of a certain religion, much less someone of a, of a different race. But uh, I want to also um, just mention something about Hawaii. You know, when I was my uh, oldest daughter, who's now a, a professor at Arizona State in organic chemistry, um, when she was in at Claremont McKenna, her undergraduate institution, um, she had an interesting um, definition of diversity. She was going out with a bunch of kids who were part of this group called the Posse, which in the Posse is a group of kids that have gotten into college that were given who were of some sort of, you know, either you know, Hispanic, African American, Asian, et cetera, and were admitted to colleges. And they, but they represented a unrepresented group. And uh, she said, Dad, you know, it's a very diverse group. You know, some students came from UCLA, some came from Claremont McKenna, some are um, from Occidental. So she used that word diverse in terms of the colleges that people came from. <laughs> so, you know, she had no clue as a Hapahali kid from Hawaii, you know, what the, what the overall, uh, divisions are. I think when kids stay in the mainland for a long, or stay in the continent for a long time, they eventually um, uh, discover this. And I have to add what from what Peter said about you know ethnic divisions in um, even in a place like China. Um, our youngest daughter is adopted, and when we were about to adopt her, and actually we were you know we were about to uh, uh, get get her, uh, the people from the orphanage kept saying to us, you know, she's great Han. She's great Han. And so, you know, for an American, you know, getting a, you know, a baby from China who's right. healthy, uh, who cares? You know, but it made me, it made, you know, both my wife and I just hysterically uh, <laughs> laugh uh, because, you know, what is this great Han business? You know, I mean, but of course, it has, it resonates in China for obvious reasons. Like Very that. much. And, and as you said uh, <laughs> about the Russians, there was a poll yes, taken 20 years ago that Russians disproportionately were nostalgic about the Soviet Union and Russians were disproportionately nostalgic about Stalin. I don't think that would be the same in Chechnya, right? So right. I think we have to remind ourselves, especially uh, Carl and I taught, teach world history. And I know that a lot of your audience is interested more than what happens in the 96822 area code. And most of these states and most of these empires have been driven and remain dominated by an ethnic group. Uh, and that's one way to write history. To answer your question though, Jay, I'm going to uh, be Talmudic, which I know you appreciate. What do you mean by progress? Because in order to answer the question about how migrants would affect well, progress, uh, uh, what do you I'll mean by progress? I'll tell you my next question, and then I'll help you oh, understand no. my previous <laughs> question. Okay, all right. That's, that's even more very, My, my more next question is what, <laughs> you know, from the four corners of this conversation, I don't, I don't think we can learn too much from these countries from Eastern Europe in the period between 1945 and now. Uh, 
I don't think the United States can learn very much from them um, because they they really, although they've had some you know some success in some ways, it's been tangential. It's been follower success, not leadership, not leadership success. Um, and uh, you know the answer to the title question here is no, nothing. Sorry, not a I thing. Think, okay, I'm I'm going to be rabbinical. Um, I think we can learn a lot, and most of it is what not to do. All right, <laughs> okay. right. But that's an important lesson. I mean, yes. yes. Uh, rather than looking at Americans as being exceptional just because they're they are Americans, exceptional exceptionalism is often not doing what somebody else did, did by mistake. <laughs> And I, I think there's some pretty valuable lessons. Um, some of them are existential, some are not. And, and I want Carl to poke holes in ones that he feels are irrelevant. Uh, one is to remember that Stalinism or the Soviet Union, while influential, was a short blip in the history of this region. Uh, what conditioned Stalinism and the Soviet regime was not just what Stalin and the Russians did, but what were pre-existing. So I think really to have this discussion, we got to put Stalin and put the USSR out of the discussion and talk about really some of the longer term. Um, communism in Eastern Europe cannot, it can be, for example, compared to apartheid. Apartheid only existed as a legal institution, in fact, as long as the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact existed in Europe. But nobody says that apartheid can only be understood by what happened in 1947 and 49. It has to be understood by long-term racism. And I think it's important for us as Americans to not focus so much on what the Soviets did, but what the Soviets could do. What was their fertile ground? All right, that's one thing. Secondly, I think we can learn, if we have not learned already, that uh, the road of ethnic nationalism it's not only littered with burned cars and dead bodies, it'll lead you right over a cliff. That's a very, very valuable lesson from this, this region, that ethnic nationalism is a no-win situation. And thirdly, as I said at the start, because I know we have to go, and, I, and again, Carl's institutional and political questions were vital, and his analysis was vital. But democracy is not just an institutional question. As I said at the start, it's a social question. It's as Carl said, who will you marry? Uh, who, will you, who will you bowl with? As we talked about with our Israeli guest, who are your kids going to go to school with? <laughs> and when, when 21st century Hungary has a publicly funded elementary school with Romai, Somalian, Jewish, Eastern Christian, uh, Magyar children, all being taught in the same classroom with the same educational tools, then come back and talk to me. Then we can talk about democracy. Yeah, Carl, what would you add to that? You know, I would, I would think, I think what Peter said is adroit. Um, I, I do think that the, one of the things that, um, that the Soviet Union and the reason that, um, not necessarily Stalin, but the whole system um, has, um, a, a fairly firm legacy, and, and the reason the poll that you that was taken uh, um, twenty years ago that Peter alluded to, um, which was um, very revealing, is that you know what the, what the what the Marxist Leninist regimes did is it provided a sort of a social welfare um, for people, you know, because you know in my trips to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, I mean there was there was people were living almost all people at sort of a lower middle class level if you could use that term um you know comparing it to the united states there's all sorts of problems with that but still yeah. that's the way i'll do it um uh, so that you have this and I, and i think what we what we learn is that you know if you know you and i, I relate it back to the united states if you fulfill people's economic needs which joe biden is trying to do right now um, then I think you're going to have a much more comfortable base uh, for a democratic movement, unless, and here's the big caveat, which is happening in Eastern Europe is, and this is this is what Tucker, Tucker Carlson is reporting out of Hungary, um, unless you have a strong man 
um, uh, who you know will sacrifice as, with Vladimir Putin also as a good example, sacrifice all sorts of democratic liberties in order to you know produce some sort of organizational um, structure, which often is not good um, to produce you know better. Um, uh, a better economic structure also. And, I'm sorry, uh, I, were you talking about Hungary or China? I was talking about Hungary <laughs> and I was also talking, yeah, very funny, hey, yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. okay. I thought you were being serious, okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, but but I, I think that I wanna add this because it's a World War II example. You know, I mean, um, we are old enough to have heard our parents talk about Mussolini and how he, you know, he made the trains run on time, right? Um, and so, you know, it's that sort of very limited thinking about the society at large um, that scares me. And although there is, uh, you know, I, I think, as I say to my students, you know, we're in a period where there is, you know, um, insurgency, and especially in Eastern Europe, uh, where there's not a lot of uh, democratic traditions of, you know, right-wing authoritative uh, leaders. Um, but, and you'll notice this, and this is why I have hope, um, that even Putin has to stand for election. Um, and um, even though it's, you know, a greater period of time, um uh that's that's really uh that's 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 it's still there are democratic democratic traditions that are still in place even though they may be fragile and i have to leave you with one comment because it came out of hawaii and you both will enjoy this it's not really related to the topic but i teach by tangent anyway um is that when uh when president medvedev was here in hawaii for the economic summit you guys may remember that he was mm -hmm. here for a while he had dinner at uh, the president of Punahou's house. And I'm getting this from uh, my uh, longtime good friend, uh, Jim Scott. And, um, you know, he was asked a series of questions. And, uh, you know, he, uh, it was before, you know, he was about to leave and, and Putin was, you know, gonna, running for office again. And they asked him, they, there were two pertinent questions and I'll leave you with this. One, he was asked, um, you know, is Putin going to win? And without hesitation and without going through his interpreter, he said, of course, which is you know, an indication of, you know, no American politician would say, of course, unless they're uh, out we of had their mind. Yeah, we have one who still does, who still does say, of course. Yeah. But the second question was the most revealing. And, and someone asked him about, well, do you have any advice for us? And this is, you know, 10 or 15 years ago about Afghanistan. And he, again, didn't go through the interpreter. He just said, get out. And I'll mm -hmm. leave you with that, that message. Well, I want you to know that I am not running against Putin in any election <laughs> because, because I do not want to glow at night. <laughs> but you also, you own the means of production. You don't need to run for election. Oh, thank you for that, Peter. Uh, so Peter, my, my, Peter, can you make a very brief closing? Very, very, and thank very Carl, brief, please. Well, Carl, always great to see and hear you, and we hope you we can come up with some other magical reason to get you back. Um, I guess I would leave in one minute with some concerns in response to what Jay said, which may 30 open, sec up, 30 seconds, which may open up further discussion. <laughs> one is what kind of capitalist progress are we talking about? So in Eastern Europe, we're generally talking about crony capitalism. We're not talking about entrepreneurial capitalism. And entrepreneurial capitalism and the ability of people to have shares is connected to some kind of democracy. Crony capitalism never is. So I want to be very careful about that. And secondly, I would remind you that a voice for democracy and a voice for cosmopolitanism is George Soros. And I'd like you to think about the Hungarian popular and official response to George Soros, who is a Hungarian and is also, of course, Jewish and also, of course, represents the West. I think, um, as they say about Jews and racism, Jews are the canary in the mind. George Soros is the canary in the mind of whether or not Eastern Europe will progress. And it really is uh, strong men versus George Soros. I leave you with that. I think there are two, at least two other conversations we can have out of this. So Carl, thanks not just for your contributions, but uh, laying some seeds for some future fruitful discussions. Thank you, you, you. Say hello to your family. Congratulations on the professorship of your daughter. That's what I call a 30-second closing, yeah. don't you? That was for me. For me. <laughs> for you. I had it's to a hold different concept back. of time. I had uh, Peter stop. Hoffenberg, yes. Carl Ackerman, thank you so much. Oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.